Happy St. Patrick's Day from everyone here at the Worldwide Center of Mathematics. So today's, instead of the advanced knowledge problem of the week, we're doing kind of a special St. Patrick's Day themed uh, advanced knowledge problem of the week, which is asking you to kind of help out our friend this leprechaun here named Patty get out of a kind of bind. So he was kidnapped by some evil mathematicians, as mathematicians do. And um, they stole all, they stole his little, his, his little leprechaun hat and they stole all of his gold pieces and they melted down the gold pieces and they poured the gold into the hat and they said, okay, you, we'll let you go on one condition. If you, if you can guess the number of gold pieces that were melted down to be put into your hat, you can go free and take all of the gold. But if not, we're going to make you do analysis proofs, epsilon delta proofs for the rest of your life. And this is terrifying for Patty as it is for, you know, any sane person. So he says, okay, I'm, he, he's, he's like, okay, I'm going to be diplomatic about this. I'm going to take some measurements. I'm going to figure out how to get myself out of here using calculus because Patty is a uh, intelligent mathematical leprechaun. So he's like, okay, we're going to use logic to get ourselves out of the situation. So he takes the measurements. Um, so first of all, he measures his hat. So he measures his hat, the uh, height of his hat as being 12 centimeters and the radius of his hat as being four centimeters because, you know, he's small and his hat is small. Uh, so then he sees that the gold pieces all kind of look like this. So he says, okay, using his advanced knowledge of trigonometric functions and their graphs and polar coordinates, he says, okay, so we know that the gold pieces, the, the top of the gold pieces have the shape governed by r is equal to sine of 2 theta. Great, okay, so he measures the thickness of the gold pieces and he sees that each gold piece is about uh, half a centimeter. Has, sorry, has half a centimeter thickness. So he's like, okay, you know what? I'm good. This is all I need to know. I can use some calculus, do some integrals, and figure everything out. So he goes about setting it up. So how are we going to end up setting this up to help Patty escape? So we know that we need to take the integral to find the area. So first of all, we're going to find the volume of each individual coin piece uh, using this graph here. Uh, and it's actually easier than it looks. So we're just going to use polar coordinates. And recall that when we integrate in polar coordinates, uh, we need to use the integrand instead of just being uh, dx. It's going to need to be 1 half r squared d theta. So we're going to need to keep that in mind when we're setting up this integral. So as we can see here, we have symmetry um, across uh, rotational, you know, reflective symmetry here across these axes. So in fact, we can just, uh, because if we try to integrate this from 0 to 2 pi, we're going to get 0 because of the symmetry. So what we're going to do is we're going to integrate from 0 to pi over 2. So we're going to get one leaf of this four-leaf clover. And then we're going, to, we're going to multiply that by four. And recall that we also need to multiply to get the volume by one half, which is just the thickness of the coin. So we can go ahead and set up this integral. So we're going to call this uh, V sub C, which is the volume of the coin. So the volume of each coin is going to be equal to the integral. Actually, put the constants on the outside here. Is going to be equal to, OK, so first of all, Let's just not forget this, bring this outside. Uh, we have one half, part of the integrand. And then we have, again, uh, another one half, um, which is going to be from the thickness of each coin. And then times um, uh, here. One half times one half times, uh, great, okay, times the number of leaves. So we have, uh, four leaves on this four leaf clover, so we have times four. And then we can go ahead and write our integral, which is going to be from zero to pi over two, because we're just integrating uh, one quarter of it. And the integrand here is going to be uh, sine squared two theta eh, d theta. Okay, great. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, simplify these constants on the outside here. So we have 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth times 4 is just 1. So all of that goes away on the outside here. And we're left with the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine squared 2 theta d theta. OK, so from here, uh, we don't have any kind of handy dandy tricks to be able to help us solve this right away. We could try doing integration by parts, but we end up having to do it multiple times. It gets pretty gross. So in fact, here, if you notice, uh, we're just going to if you notice this kind of trick that you can do, we're just going to do a change of variables by letting phi equal to uh, 2 theta. So, okay, we're going to go ahead and let phi equal 2 theta, and then d phi is going to be equal to 2 d theta. Because differentiating here with respect to theta just gives us 2. 
OK, so now we're going to rewrite this integral. Oh, and before we rewrite the integral, we need to recalculate the bounds of integration. So as you see here, this is saying uh, theta is equal to 0 and theta is equal to pi over 2. And we know here that phi is equal to 2 theta. So OK, so we need to set uh, our bounds of integration in terms of phi, not in terms of theta. So we know that when theta is equal to 0 here, uh, phi is also going to be equal to 0. And when theta is equal to pi over 2, like up here, we know that pi over 2 times 2 is just going to be pi. So then phi is going to be equal to pi. So we have our new bounds of integration with respect to phi, which are 0 and pi. OK, great. So now we can uh, rewrite our integral in terms of phi. OK, so we end up getting v sub c. Again, is just going to be uh, the integral here, 1 half on the outside. Because of the constant here, you have to divide by 2 in order to get d phi by itself. 1 half times the integral from 0 to pi of sine squared of phi d phi. OK, perfect. So from here, just go ahead and erase this down here. From here. We can uh, use a double angle formula in order to help us, because we can't really easily, unless you have this memorized what this is, which you probably don't, we can just use a double angle formula here in order to help us calculate that integral. OK, so keeping the uh, 1 half on the outside, great. the 1 half on the outside, and we know by the double angle formula that sine squared of phi is going to be equal to 1 half times quantity 1 minus cosine phi. So I'm going to go ahead and bring the 1 half out to the outside, and then we're going to multiply this integral here from 0 to pi of, and then in here we have 1 minus cosine of uh, 2 phi d phi. Okay. So now I'm going to combine 1 half times 1 half on the outside, and then I'm going to use the linearity of the integral to uh, split this integral up here into two parts. So I'm going to go ahead and say 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth. This is going to be equal to 1 fourth times the integral from 0 to pi of 1 d phi uh, minus 1 fourth times the integral from 0 to pi of cosine 2 phi d phi. OK, so from here, it's just straightforward integration. Um, so we integrate 1 fourth. We integrate 1 uh, d phi with respect to phi, and we just get phi. Uh, 1 fourth phi evaluated from 0 to pi minus, so the integral of cosine 2 theta is going to be 1 half sine 2, uh, excuse me, cosine 2 phi is going to be sine 1 half times the sine of 2 phi. 1 half times 4th is going to be 1 eighth. So we get 1 eighth here times the integral from 0 to pi. Oh, not integral, excuse me. Uh, 1 eighth times uh, sine, sine of 2 phi evaluated from 0 to pi. And I just kind of left off the constants here because we have a definite integral, so the constants will just subtract away and go to 0 anyway. OK, so we're getting close here to the, the final problem. So we, we, uh, we set phi equal to pi here, and we get 1 fourth times pi. Uh, we set phi equal to 0, and it just goes to 0. And we notice here that sine of 2 times pi, sine of 2 pi is just 0, and also sine of 0 is going to be 0. So this entire term is going to go to 0, and we're just left with pi over 4 centimeters squared, cubed. Excuse me. So we've calculated the area, uh, excuse me, the volume of each one of these coins. And now we need to just calculate the area of the hat, which is just a cylinder. And then we can just divide the area of the cylinder of the hat by the area of each coin to determine how many coins were melted down to fill up the hat. So after all that calculus, calculating the volume of the hat is going to be no big deal. We'll just use the formula for the volume of a cylinder, which, as you may recall, so I'll call this um, V sub H is volume of the hat. 
this is going to be equal to pi r squared h. So we know from over here, r is going to be 4, uh, and h is going to be 12. So we have v sub h here is equal to pi times 4 squared times 12, which is equal to pi times 16 times 12, which is equal to 192 pi. And this is in centimeters cubed. I should have noted here at the beginning that r is equal to sine of 2 theta is measured in centimeters, just so we have some kind of dimensions on our measurement there, or an equation there. Okay, so now we know the volume of the hat is equal to 192 pi. The volume of each coin is equal to pi over 4 centimeters cubed. So in order to find the total number of coins, we're going to take the volume of the hat, so v sub h divided by v sub c, which is the volume of the coin. This is going to give us v sub h is 192 pi. So 192 pi times the reciprocal of v sub c, which is going to be 4 over pi. We just flip that fraction there times 4 over pi, and this is going to be equal to, the pi's cancel out here, we get 192 times 4, which is equal to 768 coins. Okay, so now, after all that kind of calculus work there, uh, we have successfully calculated the number of coins that were melted down to be able to fit into Patty's hat. So, Patty goes ahead and tells mathematicians that he's figured it out using some handy-dandy calculus tricks, and... Unfortunately, they have to let him go. You know, no more analysis proofs for Patty, so Patty gets to go free. Um, so just kind of shows the power of math there. Uh, so again, um, from all of us at the Worldwide Center of Mathematics, we hope you have a great St. Patrick's Day. And to see more of these holiday special posts kind of playlists, uh, kind of videos, you can see our playlist here. Subscribe to us here at the Center of Math. Click on this link here. And visit us at centerofmath.org. Click this link here. Thank you for watching.